Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and welcome to Chattering with Nicholas Vince. And this week I am chattering with Paul Kane. Say hello, Paul. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> <laughs> Third time now. I had you on the Christmas Third show. Time. Yeah, yeah. I had you on the, and we were talking about, uh, we had you on before as well. Okay. So I'm going to come back to Paul in just a few moments. Um, before I do that, I would just like to, there's some uh, things that I want to share with everybody. So I'm going to start a screen share. Yay. Cool. And so I'm going to just put that there and present to everybody, present to everyone. And cool. Um, so the first thing I wanted to say is congratulations to everybody who's involved in RATS, um, which we are filming next weekend, um, and uh, Undisclosed Castle. I keep on remembering I'm not allowed to say the name of the castle. I'm going to be w working with uh, Lawrence Harvey again, and Mark Logan is directing, and a whole load of people I've worked with before, um, including Candice, who's a producer, and uh, Katie Bonham, who directed Remnant. Um, Sorry, she didn't direct Remnant. She was first AD on Remnant. She directed Mindless. It's already beginning. Okay, so uh, as you see, we've actually they've actually got it over their funding tar uh, target, but there is about another 12 hours if you want to join the team rats um, on Indiegogo. Just look for rats under Indiegogo. Just a reminder to everybody, please have a look at my video for EXGF, We Are The Hearts. Um, it's got about 340 odd views so far. Um, I'd really like to get it up to at least 500 um, before I stop plugging it. Um, I'd really like to see it get to 1,000. But yeah, check out EXGF. There'll be a link on uh, my Facebook page everywhere for EXGF. Um, Quick note about Remnant, directed by Andy Stewart, the short film I made earlier this year. That is going to premiere at Celluloid Screams uh, at the end of October. Um, it's on the opening night immediately before Goodnight Mommy, as Andy says, no pressure then. That's a great honor. Um, it literally is on the first night, so one of the first two uh, short films to be screened. Really looking forward to seeing that one. Um, Mindless, just a quick update on Mindless. We don't have a screening for that one yet. This is the one that's directed by uh, Katie Bonham, uh, written and directed by Katie Bonham, and uh, I will keep you posted on that one when I know when that one's first going to be visible, but I'm uh, really looking forward to seeing that one as well. Uh, next week's show, I wasn't sure if there was going to be a show next week, and um, because it's only discovered yesterday uh, that I can do a show next week, I'm going to um, do an original versus remake, and I'm going to do George Romero's The Crazies. Um, I really like the second film. I've never actually watched the first film, so um, I've got that waiting for me downstairs to be done. So we're going to be talking about The Crazies next week to come and join me. The week after, on October the 4th, Call Girl, starring Lawrence Harvey and Tristan Risk, direct written and directed by Jill Six Gavagizian. I knew I was going to get this wrong. I'm not confident in the pronunciation. Jill Six is going to be coming and joining me um, on October the 4th. So that will be my guest then. Cool. All right. So that is, sorry, my mouse is being really slow. So I'm now, you can see me again, hopefully. Cool. And I can get rid of this. Bear with me. For, I'm getting a new computer, folks. You're going to be so pleased. <laughs> It's getting harder and harder to work with this one. Cool. All right. Uh, I'm gonna stop. So, as I say, the reason why I'm going to take my glasses off because you won't be able to see me. <laughs> you won't be able to see my eyes at all. You're all right, Paul, but my, mine, I just look like headlights. Um, so, uh, the reason we're, we're talking to Paul this week and the reason I invited Paul back, as I sh showed last week, is this nice, shiny book, Monsters. <laughs> Uh, by Paul Kane, and we're going to talk, discuss our top three monsters. Um, before we do that, actually, I'm going to put my glasses back on again because I just remembered I promised myself I'm going to do something. Um, and I thought I'd start our talk by reading the um, introduction that I wrote for Paul's book. Okay, so this is my introduction to Monsters by Paul Kane. So bear with me. Personally, I never read introductions to books. They almost certainly contain spoilers, and I really hate spoilers. This introduction contains spoilers to some movies, but hopefully not to the stories in this volume. So I'll write about the dedication. It reads, for Boris, Baylor, and Lon, the original monsters. But really, they weren't. They were actors and needed makeup to transform from the human to the monstrous. 
The Frankenstein Monster, Boris Karloff, Dracula Bela Lugosi, and the Wolfman Lon Chaney Jr., son of Man of a Thousand Faces Lon Chaney. They're remembered, remembered fondly by many people, particularly in America, as their films were shown on TV after school in the 1950s and celebrated in magazines such as Famous Monsters of Filmland. They were the misunderstood, the cursed, and victims of their irresponsible, uh, irrepressible urges, which manifested in bodies at odds with the, their desire for peace and love. In short, they were teenagers. Humanity hidden or lost perhaps defines the monstrous. Instinctively, we don't trust a person who wears a mask and want to rip it from their face, like Christine in The Phantom of the Opera. Today, the images which instill dread in many of us are men swathed in black, wielding Kalashnikovs or swords. Of course, there are the monsters whose mask is a charming smile. Uncle Charlie and Alfred Hitchcock's Shadow of Doubt, Shadow of a Doubt, played by Shadow of a Doubt, The Hitcher, played by Rutger Hauer. Frank and Julia in Clive Barker's Hellraiser are some of my favorites. And we do have favorite monsters, don't we? We admire them because they represent the thrill of sexual danger, a willingness to break the rules which sometimes frustrate us. They are the conquerors of death and maybe, like the Fusca sisters' eponymous American Mary, they're the victim who turned and took revenge. They have permissions we deny ourselves, and perhaps we envy them that freedom. In Paul's book, there are the monstrously inhuman and those all too human. There are traditional monsters, including the zombies, a funny demon, and one who haunts us all. But honestly, I really don't want to spoil the surprise in, in these sort of stories. You want to meet monsters? No need to travel to the end of the known world, enter the forest, Pay to enter the freak show, look in the mirror or under the bed. Just turn the page. Cool. There we are. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. It's me stumbling around all over the place. But I, I, I think the obvious question to ask you, Paul, is you know, why monsters? Why did you decide to do a collection about monsters? Uh, I think... I mean, monsters have always been with me, really, um, from when I was very little, watching Doctor Who and Star Trek. And um, The Incredible Hulk was one of the first monsters that I, that I saw on TV. And the way his eyes used to change when he got angry and, and just, you know, I just loved the monsters growing up. And that, that's always kind of stayed with me through the writing as well. So when I look back at my my career, <laughs> laughing to call my career, um, I, I found that I got quite a few monster stories. So uh, I just put together a book of ghosts for Spectral, um, like a themed collection of ghosts. So I started to think about other themed collections. So I thought, well, monsters is obviously, you know, the next choice because I've got so many of these monster stories, um, probably, probably more than one volume of them. But um, I, I, I just started to pick the best ones or my favourite ones from over the years, really. So that's how it came about. <laughs> right, right. And, and we talked earlier on, so I'm going to take my glasses off again. Um, I don't need to read anymore. Um, so we've now, we both decided to choose our top three literary and film monsters. So we'll go with yours. For, uh, let's do turn and turn about, actually. I'll, you do one of yours. I'll do one of mine. And let's start with your with your um, your first one. Your first movie monster is The Thing. Why did you choose The Thing? Um, the Thing. Uh, I mean, as much as I love the, the black and white version, The Thing from Another Planet, from another world, sorry. Um, I think the John Carpenter one, the remake, uh, got back to the basics of the original John W. Campbell um, novella, which we reprinted in Body Horror, if you remember, um, the Mammoth Book of Body Horror. We reprinted oh, right. Ago. Um, so I just, I love the kind of paranoia, as well as the monster aspect of it, and not knowing who's, re who's really the monster, who's not the monster. I love the, the kind of, um, the, the paranoia of the the claustrophobia and the people stuck in this kind of place they can't get away from the monster they're, they're with each other nobody knows who's who and i just think the john carpenter version just got it absolutely spot on really um it's i saw it when 
I probably shouldn't have done, but I, s I snuck downstairs, which I, I know you said you you've done before when you were when you were little and watched the horror movie at like midnight or something like that. And I watched. The well, no, no, no. I didn't. I didn't have to sm have to sneak. Mum was quite happy to, for me to watch horror movies. Um, oh. I used to. Um, we lived in a bungalow as well, so we never slept downstairs. Um, that would have been weird. Um, <laughs> 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 but no, no, it was, it, it was, it was um, we didn't really have to sneak. Mum was quite happy. But of course, I mean, the horror movies I'm talking about are much earlier than yours. We, I'm talking about the universal horror movies. There wasn't, a, you know, apart from in Christopher Lee's Dracula, there wasn't a lot of blood involved. And if it was blood, it was black and white. So, yeah. you know, yeah. it, it was like... So, yeah, so you, you, snuck, you snuck down and watched, watched this from the door? Yeah. or? It was on ITV. I remember there were adverts for it before I went to bed, and and um, when everybody had gone to bed, I think it was like half past eleven, midnight, something like that. And I snuck down kind of quietly and put the the TV on with the sound down and everything. And I think it was a it was on that bit where they're doing the autopsy of the monster, and I watched kind of five ten minutes of that and just thought, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> The next day, the next day, I couldn't eat my Sunday dinner. I remember that. <laughs> Vivid. Um, <laughs> so that was my first experience of the thing, uh, and obviously watched it um, and watched it many times since then. Absolutely love it. Uh, I love um, uh, Macready, the character of Macready. I just think he's fantastic. From the moment he's introduced uh, with the with the chess game, he's playing a game of chess with the electronic um, compute. You know the the, the you know, electronic chess yeah. game, and he pulls his whiskey in there and says, cheating bitch. <laughs> <laughs> this is Kurt Russell. This is Kurt Russell playing Kurt McCree. Russell, yeah. yeah. I think that's yeah, absolutely. And he never really was... changes throughout the film. The <laughs> McCready's. <laughs> well, we discussed this, we discussed the, we discussed the thing at length, at length on one of the previous shows because I did an original versus remake and we went into this in a great deal of detail. I, it's, it's a great movie. It really is a great movie. Okay, well, that's your first one. I'm going to go with my first one now and that is The Abominable Dr. Fibes. Ooh, good. Ooh, I just, I mean, I, A, I loved the makeup when I saw it. Um, it is Vincent Price not moving his lips. Uh, that's, you know, he he's, he he plays it. He does speak, but only by putting the thing in the back of his neck, um, so that it, which leads to it. And it's also, I, I love you know, um, Volvia. Her name Volvia. Yes, his his sidekick. <laughs> vaguely rude, um, and it's just the whole design of it. This whole dark art deco thing, but the the killings are just brilliant um as, you know i mean the, you know the most the fact that you've got captain mannering uh in bed and then you know whoosh, um i don't want to give away too many of these things but it, I, it's just completely over the top i mean there was just nothing like it um you know it's it's melodrama high melodrama done, but done incredible style really done in an incredible style um so and obviously if anybody isn't familiar with Abominable Dr. Fibes, <laughs> you can see him there. That is the Abominable. It's just the most wonderful. It's got his, I said in the back of his neck, it's the side of his neck that the thing gets plugged into. Um, for, uh, uh, yes, yeah, so Abominable Dr. Fibes is my first one. Sorry, Lawrence. Just moving Lawrence's picture around there. Um, so yeah, so abominable Doctor Five. So that's my first one. Who's your next one? Um, my next one is Dawn of the Dead. Dawn of the Dead. Yeah, a massive zombie fan, uh, massive George A. Romero fan, um, and I just think I mean I, I do love Night of the Living Dead, but I think Dawn of the Dead is the one where it all came together really for for me anyway and the the commentary on kind of people shuffling around in in the in the uh, big mall and you know they're they're us and you know just absolutely fantastic i actually uh, met ken Ferry um a few months ago at horicon in rotherham and uh, he is actually that big in real life <laughs> <laughs> I've met Ken a couple of times. Yeah, he's a really, really nice guy and very tall. Um, he is. He's very kind of. 
but yeah, just everything about it really. Um, the just I'm a massive I'm a massive zombie fan, and I think that just got everything perfect. Um, Dawn of the Dead. So it's it, it's very interesting. I, I think I love the first movie. I think as many people, it's that claustrophobia of the first movie. Mm. Um, it's the child is that yeah. you know is, is one of the most terrifying moments uh in the thing. i mean i they're coming to get you barbara <laughs> it's one of my favorite lines from any movie um absolutely I, 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 but i only watched i only watched dawn of the dead recently within about the last uh, six months or so and i know what you mean it's again it's that thing of okay so the world's now gone to pot we've seen everything yeah. you know it's and also the first one's obviously done in black and white and you therefore have that wonderful those wonderful deep shadows and so on the second one uh the dawn of the day it's bright sunshine yeah it's not yeah. at night it's you know it's what do we do during the daytime folks and these things don't die during the daytime um it's it really is yeah i i, I completely understand why you chose that one there are some really suspenseful moments i don't know if you you remember there's some bits where the where the characters are kind of wrestling with the zombies and you don't know whether they're going to bite them or and they're rolling around. Is that bit where Ken's got the gun and he's pointing it um, at the zombie, but his friend is in the way? And, you know, some really suspenseful moments that go on quite a long time, you know, quite sort of Hitchcockian <laughs> in a way. You know? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think what I also particularly like is the fact that, as you say, because you, you know that one possibly may die that you know what is you know how long can they carry on basically um yeah and also i think it's that thing of in the first movie you've got we cannot leave the house we've just got to stay here and get out yeah because there's that sense that element of risk where i'm going to leave the safe place to go into the dangerous place to try and and therefore i'm really vulnerable yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, we're really vulnerable, and obviously, we know slightly more than they do as to how just how vulnerable they are. Um, and you really, uh, you know, it, it's 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 nice and it's bright day. It's open, as I was saying before, and but yeah. people really are just very very vulnerable um, on that one. So yeah, yeah, I, I yeah, completely agree with that one. I absolutely. Okay, um, my next uh, film one is Count Prospero. From Mask of the Red Death, Ooh, oddly yeah. played by Vincent Price, um, because he's the philosopher. You know, he's not. He's char. He's he is a man with power, completely remorseless, challenging God, wanting to corrupt innocence, has no scruples about burning. Of you know. When he discovers the plague of the Red Death is in the village, he says, "Just burn them, kill them all, burn them." And it's no, there's no question about it. Um, I'll take these, two, these three healthy people with me because it's going to amuse me, and I think I can cause them suffering. Um, and he does it with such charm, wit, and elegance. You know, he's absolutely entrancing on screen, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and he's intelligent. You know, and and I think there are reasons. Again, obviously, I, sh I watched this as part of the whole Corman Price or anything Friday nights with my mum, and so. On. And it was that whole questioning of and I'm a teenager. It was the whole questioning of God um, and what is right and what you know. And if the man's got the power, surely that's he, you know he can create his own morality. And where is God when you look around the world um, at everything that's going on? I think you know that was absolutely fascinating to me um and, and the fact that all these parties are going on inside his place and you know every everybody's suffering outside of the the castle and and he's just kind of carrying on and having these great parties like gatsby or something you know he's kind of just not taking any you know notice of and just just having a good time really isn't he yeah i'd not i'd not see the the um the thing with gatsby before but you're absolutely right yeah and it is and there, there are just those wonderful moments um in it where you know this the count and is is, is uh, uh, some other prince or count or, or um i said count prospero because he's prince prospero he's not count prospero um uh count turns up with his his wife, big fat count, and he's like, yeah, now I'll give you my wife if you let us in. 
I've already <laughs> had that dubious pleasure. Um, and it, it has has the has the count shot and then just flings a dagger to the to the woman. It's like ah, oh, it's just horrible, you know. <laughs> I'm laughing at this. As I say, we all have our favourite monsters. And there's, he's terrible. He's an appalling human being. Don't get me wrong. He's got but style. Love. He's got style. He's got incredible <laughs> style. He's got incredible style. And, and I, you know, there's a moment in the movie as well where he kind of talks about his father um, as well. And it, it's, you know, what his father has done. You kind of think, oh, yeah, I, now I understand why you're so completely fucked up. Um, <laughs> Very nice, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. Uh, your third movie choice is King Kong, the Peter Jackson version. Yeah, it was a difficult one. This because I nearly went for Godzilla and Cloverfield. I love Cloverfield as well. I just love big monsters, you know, Pacific Rim. That I mean, I'm hearing rumours now that they might combine Clover, uh, Pacific Rim, King Kong, and Godzilla, which to me would be I would I would watch the hell out of that film. <laughs> Because they did, King, because they did King Kong and Godzilla, starring Sean Connery. Oh, I've not come up. Um, I, 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 my mum took me to see it at the movies. Um, oh, wow! It was it, obviously, therefore, it wasn't rated eighteen. I must have been about fifteen, sixteen years on. I think it's called King Kong, and it's a metal gone Godzilla. Track that down, um, and it, it's. It's, and it's Sean Connery, and it's um, obviously made by the studio that made the Godzilla movies. Yeah. It's very, I'm not saying that it's a good, good movie. I'm saying it exists. Um, <laughs> and it's got Sean Connery in it. Um, oh, well. I'm, I'm, but, I'm but, sorry, sorry, back to you. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, Godzilla. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, not Godzilla. I think King Kong. King Kong. King Kong, King Kong. Um, I think it's the same thing again as um, the thing from the world. It's it's like I love the black and white King Kong. You know, don't get me wrong, but I think the Peter Jackson one just had there was something about the emo you know, the emotion was there with the with the ape and the relationship. You know, with with um, with Naomi Watts' character, mm. it's just it's just there. It's all there on the screen. You know, it's uh, it's in the eyes. It's in the kind of portrayal of it. And I think that just adds some, and it's got you know the dinosaur fights and things. Um, I was, I'm, I'm there. You know, it's. <laughs> it, I just to me, it's it's a it's a great version. Of King Kong. It's very interesting because I think, have you have you seen the black and white version recently? Yeah. Uh, not recently. I've seen it many times. Yeah, I was, it's, it's interesting. I, I I remember the. I don't. You're absolutely right because, because technologically speaking, you've got Andy Serkis doing all the facial expressions. Is what he refers to as performance capture, yeah. um, and you really do get. You can see the expression of King Kong, and that you know that scar across the guy. You know, this is an old, old creature yeah. who's on its own, yeah. who no longer has a family. Yeah. And he's obviously very lonely, and is, that's the reason why he's seeking out companionship. Um, I, it's a great movie. I mean, I do love it. I do love. I think it's, it's a great movie, and I, um, it just it kind of takes its time to build up that relationship as well. When he's sort of watching her performances that she used to do, you know, the vaudeville kind of performances, and then there's a lovely scene at the end where they're on the ice. Yeah, if you remember, on the ice, uh, and then all it's really quiet, and then all of a sudden they start bombing. <laughs> it's just a fantastic scene it, it, you know there are loads of scenes in, in the film like that and I just think it's wonderful it, it, it is absolutely great I'm having some there are some comments coming through I'm going to take a small break um, and I'm just going to mark off on, on my uh, thing which ones of these we've actually done just to make sure that I don't forget to come back to the relevant person to the relevant part um Paddy Murphy says, beautiful cover art by Clive Barker on the book Monsters. Um, Ferguson Geek is uh, waiting to see Blood Red. Uh, you will see the cover. I'm not going to forget, honestly. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I think we all, Paddy says, I think we've all snuck down and watched a horror movie. We shouldn't. I did the same with Nightmare in Elm Street. At five years old, Paddy, really? <laughs> Five years old. Respect. I, I, total respect. I saw it was 23 in a cinema. It terrified me. I've probably told you this story before. It's just like, I, that, 
I was holding on to the girl I was supposed to be supposedly protecting to watch that movie. It's terrifying. Yeah. It, can re it really is. Um, yeah. Ferguson says, I had to listen to the audio commentary at the age of eight just to get through Elm Street. I had snuck downstairs but ended up sitting on the sofa watching it with mum myself. I remember getting up at 2 a.m. one morning and she was having another of her 30 fags a day. We sat down and watched Carrie, who is the most redeemable on-screen monster, I feel. Uh, that's a very yeah. interesting point. Yeah, absolutely. Then after, even at the tender age of eight, telling her how it was made. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was very yeah. That is a very interesting carry movie. Uh, is a very interesting interesting movie. Of the late, the late great Wes Craven, who passed away. Yes, recently. absolutely. Of course, yeah, yeah. I, I just treat again. You know, yeah. So, um, yeah. I think you, everyone was absolutely the outpouring of love from our community, our lovely horror family for Wes Craven, because it's extraordinary um, yeah. imagination and stuff. Okay, cool. All right, I'm going to hurry us along because as usual, we're taking too long. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to go, so I'm very, again, going to share that my, my third favorite movie monster is Edward Lionheart from A Theatre of Blood. Uh, and for those of you who know, you've probably spotted the theme here. It's Vincent Price. <laughs> Vincent Price played all my favorite monsters in movies. And again, it's one of those movies which I love because it's the way people get killed. <laughs> <laughs> it's just such imagination. It's, I'm trying, desperately trying to think, remember the name of the actor um, who plays one of the, um, who plays a food critic. Because th those of you who don't know, um, basically the, uh, the idea is that Edward Lionheart is a, is a hat is an actor who uh, believes he should go to a critic award, but he's too much of a ham actor. Uh, he leaps to his death, supposedly, and then suddenly all the critics from the critic circle, um, Robert Morley, thank you very much. Thank you, Craig, um, played the food critic. And then all the deaths are based on Shakespearean deaths. And Robert Morley is, I think it's Cymbeline, uh, where the, um, the, the basically the, his, his children, in inverted commas, are fed to him in a pie. And it's dust. Have you seen it recently, Paul? Not recently, no. No, a long time it's, ago. But... It really, I mean, again, it's one of those ones that combines comedy with Eric Sykes, isn't it, playing a policeman. And it's, just, <laughs> and it's Robert Morley, and it's got Milo O'Shea uh, in it as playing a policeman. It's just it's just wonderful. Really, is a wonderful film. This cool. Is we'll, we'll, we'll... This is making me want to rewatch all those choices of yours. Um... <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Well, I mean, I, I mean, the thing I obviously watched recently, *A Dawn of the Dead*, I watched recently, but I really want to see *King Kong* again now because of that. You, you're absolutely right because of the expression. Cool. All right, we'll move on to the literary choices now. Um, uh, your first literary choice is *I Am Legend*. Yes, um, just a wonderful book. If if you've not read it, if people have not read it, I highly recommend it. Um, it's basically, I mean, the idea of kind of uh, Dracula and the vampire and everything to make that a virus, and to have kind of a post-apocalyptic feel to it, and him be the only man that's not infected, uh, and that just really appeals to to me. I mean, it's it's been an influence on some of my work, like Luna, which is getting made into a film. Um, just it's had a massive impact on me. Um, I, I am Legend, and all the different versions. I love all the different movie versions of it as well. Um, I love the uh, Vincent Price one again, the, the Vincent Price one from the nineteen sixties. And there's the Omega Man. The, the Omega Man, yes. I thought it was the Omega Man. Last Man on Earth, I think it's called, from the 1960s, a Vincent Price one. Yes, Last Man on Earth, yes. Man on Earth. And I love the Will Smith one as well. I just think, you know, all the, all the different versions. Uh, but it's, is it Matheson written by? Richard Matheson, yeah. yeah it's, just, it's written by, and he didn't. He didn't like any of the movie versions of his work. No, <laughs> <laughs> no. But I, I, just, I just think that it was such a wonderful idea. And, Strangely enough, it was when we interviewed George A. Romero a few few years ago. In his, we went back to his hotel room and he was sat drinking rum and kind of opening up about things. And that was one of the influences for Night of the Living Dead was I Am Legend. So there's a bit of a theme going on with that as well. Interesting. <laughs> so, yeah. Very interesting. So yeah, but just 
the yeah, just the whole package really as far as i'm concerned i'm legend it's just wonderful cool all right then well my my first literary choice is frankenstein and i mean victor frankenstein not the creature because i think um the creature does monstrous things but basically he's an abandoned child he's yeah. a child he's abandoned and and that doesn't excuse what the but again, this is the, the, the classic thing of what I was saying earlier on in the introduction to your book. It's He is a classic teenager. He's lonely. He doesn't understand his body. He doesn't understand his desires and what it is that he wants to do. And if and I'm pro I must have said this before because I say it all, a lot. Um, read the book. Look for the speech of the, the creature at the end where he likens himself. And he just says, at the fall, Satan had fellows. I am utterly alone. Um, I, I just think, and just wonderful writing, absolutely just wonderful writing, and and really um, extraordinary. So I've caught myself stroking my beard, and I get told <laughs> off for that because I look like a Bond villain if I stroke my beard, according to my husband. Um, <laughs> cool. So your your second literary choice is The Rats by James Herbert. Yeah, again, it's one of those ones that caught me quite early on, like formative years. I think it was the first horror novel I ever read. Um, I mean, Jim's stuff kept getting passed around in the playground. And, you know, when you, you know, the whole kind of 70s, 80s thing of bit being passed around. Oh, look at the look at these bits. Look at this bit where somebody gets eaten. And, you know, obviously there was sexual content in there as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, I just love the whole, uh, the, the, again, it's like, it goes goes back to the old monsters because I think he was influenced by Dracula, wasn't he? Where the where the uh, character just kind of collapsed into a load of rats, and I think there was an old film where that. Uh. I want to think was which one it was now, but um, I think that influenced uh, Jim's writing of the rats, and again, it's like that kind of primal fear. Of, uh, which is, you know, obviously, again, it, it if you go back and read it, which I did later on, there's a lot of political stuff in it as well about kind of, you know, the streets not being kept clean. And that's why, you know, there's all this stuff. Yeah. happening, and, and obviously, he's kind of a working class school teacher, the, the protagonist. And um, it, it's just, again, it's, it's just a terrifying book, <laughs> really. You know, just put fear of God into you, all these rats kind of. Well, DJ, I don't know. I'm still not sure if I've ever read rats i can't remember if i have i i, I think i i'm older than you <laughs> so it's a different generational thing i mean it, 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 alistair mclean were the books that were being passed around the school when i was you know a, a, a dead. um but i will come on but and, and i was the weirdo who read bram stoker's dracula um <laughs> And I remember it being lost and being handed in, and the secretary giving it back to me at school and saying, "You're reading this." Yeah. Uh, again, it's the sexuality and, and so on, but also it, it's just you know um, uh, that. And Craig is just chipping. Uh, Ferguson has just chipped in. I think you're the only person I ever met on Earth who has got the truth in Andy Serkis's performance as King Kong. Also, a very, very epic film that never leaves your consciousness, impacted by a deep score. It's great you guys admire it. Um, and uh, Craig's contribution to this is James Herbert's The Fog. Is yes. The monster is a chemical weapon let loose. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, it, James, you know, he wrote these wonderful monster books, basically. Yeah. But I think... That, Funnily enough, the rats, of course, the one that really influenced me was Death Watch. Doom Watch. Doom Watch. It's possibly before yours. It's where um, so many, basically, it was a science fiction BBC program. Yeah. Doom Watch. Yeah. And the, one of the first ones was um, uh, about rats. Right. And it is on TV, and it's these rats by, you know, it's suddenly attacking people. And there's, I remember a school playground with a plague of rats running across them um and uh robert powell started his career in doom watch um the actor um known mostly to english audiences i suspect um benjamin Moore loved james herbert it was the rat sequel lair that first got me into horror literature at age 11 first time i've ever read a novel in one sitting couldn't tear my eyes away from it uh, yeah. benjamin yeah. Yeah, I could, yeah. yeah. I all, all, three, all three books, the whole 
trilogy and then there's kind of a graphic novel called the city as well which is a post-apocalyptic thing uh, just a right. whole kind of series of the, the rats you know are just fantastic yeah, I, I, it's not from the rats, I don't think, but there is, a, if you've ever come across King Rat and the concept of King Rat, um, where rats get their tails tied together and so on, yeah. uh, that's, that's one of those rats, not nice things. <laughs> Which reminds me of a movie I'm making next weekend. <laughs> but not the rats, not by James Herbert. Uh, <laughs> um, so I've mentioned my second choice, which is Dracula. Um, my second is definitely... Uh, because of the sex in it and so on. So your third choice is The Day of the Triffids. Yeah. Um, again, it, it, post-apocalyptic stuff with me is, is a big <laughs> thing, yeah. obviously, with the arrowhead, yeah. the hood of man stuff, um, which is you know mainly what I write. Uh, but, yeah, it's again, it's that thing of not only have you got one thing that's gone wrong, which is the, the you know, meteorites, the comets going over and everybody goes blind, which is bad enough. You've also got these things that, that humanity have created like genetically modified you know these these sort of these things that that then escape and start attacking people uh, or I, i'm trying to think now did they come from outer space i'm trying no to no they, they no they were genetic it was the oil I, I don't think that it was they were genetic it was the oil yeah. the triffid oil and they they were created by man i think yeah. it's difficult because you're on to see films at, at different explanations from i don't think they were aliens i think they are just a strain of plants that has been that yeah. basically sees its chance yes yeah it's kind of a survival of the of the fittest thing uh, I've i think a- I mean, the, the version that the BBC did. The, yeah. I was going to yeah. say, John Tatine, I, I remember <laughs> that. And it is just, I think because it, it's, a, uh, it's a picture plant, they use a picture plant as being the, um, the, the model for the Triffid. Uh, in that, you know, that wonderful... Um, the Triffids were bred for, oil, for their oil in Russia. Yeah. That's from Craig. Um, yeah. yeah. I, 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 this is, it's that so I, say again? Just, just the rattling sound. I don't know if you remember. There was kind of yes. a like rattle sound. Yes. And people who were blind would go, "Oh, what's that?" And then suddenly, got you know, stinger came out and <laughs> around their face. Yeah. So even if you weren't blind to begin with, they yeah. tapped the eyes. Anyone? Um, yeah, just wonderful <laughs> monsters. It's great. I'm guessing the plot coming up in Twitter on my Twitter feed. <laughs> Craig's really good at this kind of thing. Cool. Uh, because a I... wonderful sequel by Simon Clark called Night of the Triffids, if, if you've not read it. There's a sequel to Day of the Triffids. Uh, ah. Clark, and that's oh, okay. as well, which picks up a, a few years later on down the line. So. Oh, okay. Cool, cool. I'm not, no, I'm not familiar with that one, but I'll, I'll check that one out. Um, my third uh, literary choice is Candyman the Forbidden. <laughs> um, I, I mean, it was really hard. It was going to be something from the books of blood. Uh, if we're talking literary, it has to be. I mean, the, probably the most amazing image I can think of is the um, uh, in the hills of the cities. But those aren't really monsters. You know, it's just those people. Um, uh, and so, and um, Midnight Meat Train. It's not the old gods under New York. It's the guy who goes out and change from the the description of how this man changes. Um, but I, yeah, I, I'm, I, you know, Candyman, Candyman, Candyman. Um, it, it, <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking over my shoulder now. If Tony Todd turns up now, I'm really screwed. Um, I really wish I hadn't done that now. It's actually it's very screwed. What's that behind you? Oh, no. I like it. Clive, you're so proud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay, cool. Um, we, I'm going to start opening this up to other people. If you would like to come on and uh, chat to us live and tell us who your uh, favourite monsters are, guys, please uh, put co- post comments. Craig will pass on. So I know who to invite uh, live. Um, but I'm going to uh, now move on to the results of the survey that I put out. Um, thank you for everybody who responded. Um, I can reveal that the results to those are naturally in at the top of the list for film are the Cenobites. I, Paul and I discussed this and said, we'll take Hellraiser and Pinhead given in our list. So I'm going to move on to the next ones now. Uh, in joint second, uh, joint 
nominal first place, if you take out the Cenobites, are Freddy Krueger and Frankenstein. And again, we mentioned you know, now whether this is Frankenstein or the Frankenstein monster. Okay. Not quite sure. I suspect people possibly meant the creature, but I don't know. It's not clear. And then uh, in joint third, nominal all these receiving equal votes are Jason Voorhees, Pale Man in Pan's Labyrinth, the Vampire Lestat, yeah. Dracula, Alien, and you'll like this, Godzilla. Yes. 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 That's, a, <laughs> that's, that's a good list. That's yeah. a good list. <laughs> it's a great list. That really is a great list, isn't it? Um, the top four literary, uh, um, and this is in order, mm. Dracula is at number top, is at the top, closely followed by Frankenstein. Then the Cenobites, and if we take out the Cenobites, we'll go down to Cthulhu and Pennywise yeah. Uh, yeah. as literary monsters. Um, so those are, uh, those are absolutely great. Thank you very much. And some, there were some questions posted on the survey um, as well, which I would like to quickly go. Um, monsters with nobility, not out and out evil doers, are always the more interesting. Um, the Hellraiser book on, oh, this is a quick one for you, Paul. Your Hellraiser book on the mythology in the films is brilliant. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but here is a question. What monster would you most like to be? Oh, um, I think I'm going to have to say a werewolf at the moment because I've, I've written so much about wolves over the last kind of year and a half. I've written Blood Red. There are three kind of werewolf stories in Monsters, one of which is a new one. Um, yeah. I wrote The Curse of the Wolf, uh, which came out earlier on this year. So I think at the moment, wolves are a big thing <laughs> for me. So uh, I think it's going to have to be a werewolf. Okay. So, That's really, I just interested. I'm I, uh, <laughs> quite hairy anyway. <laughs> Say again? I'm quite hairy anyway. So. <laughs> it's not coming through. It's when it's on the palm of your hands, I believe, you have to worry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, it's interesting. What monster would I like to be? I, I kind of, it's interesting. Yeah, because I think in terms, if you want to be a monster, you'd want to be a really powerful monster. Yeah. And probably it would be Prince Prospero. And I don't know if, I mean, speaking as an actor, playing, playing monsters is really good fun. Um, yeah. We all like playing monsters. Um, and I, it's quite, and it's actually rats, that Mark, the, the next part I'm playing is, um, he's, he's not a monster. I'm not playing the bad guy, um, which is going to be really, I'm really looking forward to actually, um, for a change, uh, not playing the bad guy. Um, <laughs> But I think, in terms of which one, I don't know, I'm going to have to really think about this, um, as yeah. to which one, yeah, which ones, because didn't say act and which monster would you most like to be? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It's, I'm, I'm constantly, I'm now reminded of um, the, uh, the line from Nightbreed, which I will misquote, uh, <laughs> when she's, I'm definitely going to misquote it, and I should really have it to hand to be able to quote it, but yeah. Yeah, you fear us, but when you dream, do you not dream of being immortal? Do you not dream of flying? Um, I think that there is that, and that's one of the reasons why we all like monsters, is because there is that something. We want to be the strange, the unnatural. We want to have powers. We want to be stronger than we are. We want to take revenge, I think, a lot of the time. I think there are a lot of the time that people want to be monsters is so they can get back at the bully. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. you know the, the worm that turned is is, is definitely what um, people. So werewolves. Okay, I'll just keep away from you at full moon, Paul. That's yeah. very straightforward. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, cool. Uh, right. So I'm going to reveal the cover of Blood Red because if I, I just want to make sure that I do that now before i forget and then we're going to talk about oh you can tell us a little bit about um blood red and okay bear with me folks i have to do something technical here and we all know how challenging i find that okay so i'm just going to screen share so 
I'm now starting the screen share. There we are, present to everyone. Cool. So this is the new cover of Blood Red, designed by Dave McKean. Yeah. Uh, so tell us a little bit about, I'll leave that up for a couple of seconds. Uh, you, you've alluded, I think, to the fact that this might be about werewolves. Is that right? Yeah. Um, I wrote a novella, uh, I think it came out about 2008, um, which was a kind of horror take on Little Red Riding Hood. Um, but it was with a kind of shape-shifting wolf who could take... It goes back to the kind of the John W. Campbell thing again. Could it be who, you know, who's that? And are they, are they the real person? That, and again, the body snatchers kind of thing. Um, and he can take any any kind of shape. He can he can become anybody, and he kind of infiltrates families. He'll infiltrate, you know, it'll be your husband or something, and then he'll eat you. <laughs> and that's that's kind of the wolf in in red. And um, stories that uh, Rachel Daniels, who's the protagonist, is a care worker. So she's kind of going around all the old folks on these this kind of rough estate. And she forgets to take the medication to one of her, her people, one of her old ladies, and has to go out late at night on the buses through this kind of almost like an urban jungle, um, urban wood. And she's being stalked by the by the wolf. Um, and that was the original novella. And I pitched uh, a sequel to that, which is kind of a short novel uh, to SST Publications, who just did Barbie's uh, collection. Yep. Um, Voices of the Damned, and um, and they said yes, and I started writing it early this year, and it should be out. Um, well, hopefully, look for more details in the next few weeks. Um, hopefully, anytime soon, it, it'll it'll be out for pre-order. Um, are we hoping to for it to be out by kind of Christmassy time? You know, so people can uh, buy it for Christmas. Um, and it's a good old fashioned. I've just been editing it this week. The final pass on on the book, and it's a good old fashioned kind of eighties sort of horror-y, proper old school horror. You know, like the James Herberty <laughs> kind of books. It's, it's a throwback to that. So if you if you like those kind of things, you'll you'll love Blood Red, and obviously great um, cover by uh, Dave McKean and introduction by Alison Littlewood. Um, so I just hope people people like it. Brilliant. Okay, well, I look forward to, to to receiving that one when it comes out. Uh, on reading that one, I'm receiving reading. Oh, I can't what I'm about. No idea what I'm talking about. Um, cool. So that's Blood Red. Now the other uh, book that we were going to uh, talk about. Um, nobody's saying that they're going to come on and join us and, and, and ask questions live. That's fine. But if anybody who's watching wants to leave comments about favourite monsters, do please you know uh, give them a give us a shout on that would be really interested to know what your favorite three monsters are um particularly if we haven't mentioned them yet um so and this came again this is a question that came from the survey and this is about sherlock holmes and the servants of hell yes. was it difficult to adapt sherlock holmes into the world of hellraiser um not really not as difficult as you might think <laughs> um because the, the i mean I grew up in in uh, sort of well watching horror things and and you know seventies and eighties, and I kind of came to Clive's work at the same time as I was coming to Sherlock Holmes and the Jeremy Brett TV series. So it's kind of all it was all a mishmash in my head anyway. Um, and obviously, more more recently, there've been a lot of Victorian horror things that have been quite popular, like Penny Dreadful. Um, Sarah Pimber did a couple of Victorian horror horror books. And it just, it seems like a kind of natural thing to, to put together, to me anyway, I, I might be a bit weird, but um, it just seemed a bit, it seemed like a natural thing because the, the Hellraiser mythology is quite, you know, is vast and it can take in a lot of different time periods. It can, you know, you can go to the far future, you can go back to kind of the, well, Clive talked about the pyramids being like the first, you know, like the lament configurations for one of the ideas for the films, I think. Um, so it, it just seemed like a, a, a natural thing to pitch. And being a fan of both mythologies and both universes, it's something that I, I knew I'd enjoy doing. <laughs> so uh, it's interesting. so, so we, uh, is this a murder mystery? Uh, I can only really say what the, what's been released so far in, in that it starts off with a kind of um, the, a lock room mystery and he's brought in because some, something's happened and obviously the, it, it, people who know Hellraiser will know what's, what's occurred 
<laughs> and then Holmes is sort of investigating that and it leads him, you know, step by step, it leads him to, to encounter, you know, down the line, this under underworld of, you know, well, the underworld in London, but also kind of the underworld in a, in a different sense. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, the, the, I think the fascinating thing about Sherlock Holmes is he does lead himself to very many interpretations yes. um, and, and different. I remember the seven percent solution, um, and you know the comedic versions and the you know the, the dark versions. Um, Rupert Everett played him. Yes, um, I was I was disappointed in that one. That one didn't really work for me, um, but I think I think it was case of the silk the, stocking. That was case of the silk stocking by Anthony Horowitz, I think, um, and BBC. Say again? I think it was a BBC. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but I, I think it's interesting. Jeremy Brett probably was the definitive Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. Um, from the steepling of the thing, you know, the fingers. Yes. 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 And it, 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 it just the whole look of him. Um, he it's so close. Holmes, didn't he? He just became Holmes. You could see that switch kind of. And he, he was Sherlock Holmes, and I think the that's the you know mark of a, a fantastic actor. Really, he just becomes that part, and he lives and breathes it. So, yeah, no, I, I think I think particularly towards the end, because unfortunately, I think during the last series, he was he'd been diagnosed with cancer, um, and he was ill towards the end of the last series. Um, but also, I think. Um, Edward Hardwick, I think, yeah. played Watson. Yes. In yeah. um, in, in in the TV series, and again, got it absolutely right because w Watson was not a buffoon as you get with um, the. Uh, oh gosh, help me! The black and white. Oh, the Basil Rathbone. Basil Rathbone. Um, yeah. Watson. Yeah. Why would it, why would Holmes keep a buffoon with him? <laughs> It <laughs> never made it, you know, that, and he's never in the, in the books and so on. It's just like, yeah, why would that just never worked for me uh, at all? Um, a doctor as well. You can't really be an idiot if you're going to be a doctor. <laughs> no, not really. Not really. And I have to, I liked the um, the recent ones with Martin Freeman and uh, Edward, um, what? Edward? No, no, I'm getting confused. Um, come a batch. Come a batch, yeah. Come yeah. Back. I really like the first two seasons, the yeah. first six, and then the third one just completely lost me, um, which I thought was just such a shame. Um, yeah. and, but then I love Moriarty. Talk about monsters, Moriarty. Moriarty is a great monster. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the Napoleon of crime. Absolutely, yeah. Who was based on a real character who I came across recently. Um, the phrase Napoleon of crime was used. Oh God, small man! I can picture his face, but uh, you know he was uh, he was in the newspapers. There really was somebody in London who was running all all the crime, uh, all the crime uh, in London. It was, it was amazing. I'm, I'm just going to share some uh, comments we've had in. Um, one again, bear with me, folks, because the mouse is. Uh, I would love to be Pinhead. Uh, this is from Ferguson, uh, talking about favourite monsters and who we'd like to be. I would love to be Pinhead. He has layers that you can either, either can strip or you can just wallow in his delicious evil wit charm and often obsessional endeavor, endeavors. Often <laughs> obsessional endeavors. Beautifully put, Ferguson. Yeah. As we see in the Scarlet uh, Gospel, determined mania. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Paddy Murphy is impressed with the cover of the book. You got yourself a sale, good sir. Excellent. Um, for, you are one, one lucky son of a gun as of late, you have the keys to hell, and whilst pushing Watson and Sherlock through the gates of hell yourself, you're still working, working, working. How do you find the world of Clive Barker's moulds and gels for the Sherlocks? Is it going to be a particular take on Sherlock that you love? Uh, I, don't, I don't think this is giving you too much. It, it, what is there about Sherlock that fascinates you, I think, is what, yeah. Yeah, um... I, I, I mean, I think uh, without giving too much away, it, it'll be mm. my 
interpretation of, of Sherlock Holmes anyway for the purposes of, of, of kind of you know um, the, the people call it a mashup <laughs> but it's a cro- it's a crossover but for the purposes of that I'm I'm kind of creating my version of Sherlock Holmes uh, but there will be like lots lots of nods to you know obviously Jeremy Brett is going to be <laughs> a big influence um, but yeah, I mean, if you think about it, there were, I mean, I watched young Sherlock Holmes, you know, the film um, from the 80s of Spielberg. Uh, yes. I think it was a week last, a week yesterday I watched it actually. And there's kind of bits in there that explain how he became so uh, cold and unemotional. And I mean, Sherlock Holmes, people think he's quite cold, he's quite an you know, unemotional character and he's, he's like deducing all the time. And if you think about it, there's, there's a kind of a, a crossover there with, with the Cenobites because they're kind of unemotional. They're not, they're kind of, they come in um, and they're, they're sort of, they've got to be kind of controlled. They've got to, so I always thought there was a kind of a nice little parallel there between Sherlock Holmes and the Cenobites because the, or he could almost kind of get his head around what they're, what they're about. Yeah. So, um, so to me, it, it, it'll be a different version of Sherlock Holmes and it'll be a different version of, of hell to the one that, that we've seen before, but it will be in that, those, both of those universes. Um, I'm well, just going to sh- share a quick question from Paddy Murphy and then I've got one of my own, which is about research. Um, amazing stuff, Paul. Can't wait to read it. Question, did you have to liaise with Clive in relation to using his characters in this book? Did he have any specific things that he had to be adhered to in relation to writing this crossover? Uh, yeah, to, to kind of, obviously, you know, it's in conjunction with Clive because, because he owns the literary copyright to, um, you know, the Hellbound Heart. And it's just in the same way that we did with Hellbound Hearts, as you know, um, mm. which anthology of, of um, Hellraiser stories we did a while back with stories from Nick and um, Barbie Wilde and lots of people, Neil Gaiman. Because, um, you know, you can't really do Hellraiser without Clive, really. You know, literary Hellraiser, you can't really do it without Clive. So, yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a big part of it. And um, he looked at the detailed synopsis at the beginning, really liked the idea. Um, and it, we just took it from there, really. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, it, it was, there was, you know, a lot of kind of backwards and forwards and, and in, input and, and stuff. Because so, I wouldn't want to do, I wouldn't want to do something without, like that without Clive's, you know, <laughs> I, you'd be a brave man to do that without Clive's. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because he'd send the Cenobites after you. It'd be very straightforward. You just send the Cenobites after you. Yeah. Um, and I just reach out just so that people. This is the book that uh, Paul is talking about. I must get, get too much reflection. Marie, yeah, yeah. With my wife Marie O'Regan. Yeah, um, absolutely, yeah. Uh, including Barbie Wilde as well. Um, uh, her sister Celise in the beginning of that, um, which yeah. is included in her recent uh, collection, yes. uh, Voices of Damned, which we talked about earlier. Um, I've got uh, a, a couple of, uh, it's interesting, um, uh, some, some top three. I just wanted to ask you about a very quick question about research, and then, and then I'm going to come to the last two questions of the last two comments that I've got because we're coming up for eight o'clock now um and i'm really trying to keep these shows around about an hour now (laughs) (laughs) it's just never gonna happen um research what research did you uh, did you just go back and reread the sherlock holmes books did you oh just uh, yeah um yeah went back and reread uh the books and lots of other books that is sherlock holmes books um Reread a lot of the of Clive's stuff, watching the films again, um, lots of research into Victorian London and other places as well. You know, just the the places I, I, I was going to use and the kind of background and society and stuff like that. Just try and make it authentic. Um, and I've, uh, I can probably mention on on here Charles Prepolek, who I did I co-edited Beyond Rue Morgue uh, with Charles, which was stories based around Poe's uh, Dupin. Uh, detective um, is steeped in kind of Sherlock Holmes uh, mythology, an expert on Sherlock Holmes, and also a horror fan. He, he loves Clive's stuff, and he's he's helping me as well with that. He's kind of the official uh, consultant for the kind of the Sherlock Holmes. Thing. So, so if I have got anything wrong, 
I'm, I'm, hoping, I'm, I'm hoping I've kind of got it got it right because I put a lot of I did do a lot of research for this. Um, but if anything's kind of slipped through the net, Charles will will say, "Oi, you know." <laughs> so yeah, so I'm very unfortunate to have to, to have Charles on board as well. So. Um, cool. really and you, you said you'd written a synopsis for Clive before. How long was the how long was the synopsis you presented to him? It was, it was quite detailed. It was about seven, eight pages long, something like that. It was a long, longer than it wasn't kind of a blurb. It was like you know a full on. Like, it, was, a, it was a real. Yeah, it was. It was this is how you know it went into detail about everything, um, and then you know obviously I got you know you can do this. You you know this this is great, and then feedback on the synopsis so you know it went backwards and forwards and and, and how long have you been working on it oh um uh, intensively probably about a year uh but it's been floating around as an idea a couple of years two three years now um i, f- I think i first went to, to clive and mark at, at seraphin uh, mark miller uh probably about it was i think it was just before my daughter jennifer went to university so it would have been about 2013 something like that right um, so a couple a good couple of years and then then once i found a publisher who was who was on board with it it was kind of sitting down and kind of intensively you know doing the research and and, and sitting down and I, I wrote the first draft over the summer this year so um it was nice to have that detailed synopsis to to work from as well uh, because I like I kind of plan things in advance. Marie doesn't. Marie Marie's kind of a um, more emotional writer than me. She kind of just sits down and it's kind of all flows. <laughs> I have to sit down with notes and you know, and <laughs> I've got to. Oh, think, yeah, and and uh, Clive, does, I remember Clive. You know, does these wonderful plot lines uh, for everything. Um, oh, Kelly Lorraine has just joined us and she just wanted to say i'm so sorry i missed this just had a customer leave hi kelly always lovely to see you kelly and i love the dresses that kelly's been wearing this week um (laughs) but that's another now hold on come on thing do uh i'm gonna be so glad when i get my new computer tell you um because that should be coming in the middle of next week uh i'm using the one that died earlier on this week and i seem to rivet it's a little bit like a zombie this computer at the moment it is you know it really is the return of the living dead um um now i have got a oh gosh, paddy i don't know if i can share all this um with you okay top three monsters i'm gonna try and read this really quickly just Okay, Freddy Krueger, an obvious one, but he's just a beautiful monster. The late, great Wes Craven really created, really created a pop culture icon with this one. What better way to kill you than in your dream? Also, I liked not really knowing if he was guilty of the presumed crime or not. He was my also my first monster, so that counts for something. I'm going to put my glasses on now. American Mary, hell, Soska. Um, the, the Soska wins American Mary, one of my great favorites as well, Paddy. Um, a woman who is trying to help misunderstood people around her and isn't really a monster, but is seen as such. A beautiful anti-hero that nails the duality of the monster. I felt that the Soskas did something very brave with this character in making us truly root for the monster. Um, that's my inverted commas, by the way. Um, he put a smiley face in. Uh, Brundlefly, fly, yet again, a completely misunderstood monster, only hoping to benefit mankind through his creation, but then it leads to his own destruction. And his life could have been so good for him, but through his avarice, it just devolves throughout. It's actually heartbreaking, really. I agree, we talked about uh, Brundlefly and the fly on this program in the original versus remake. Uh, amazing performance, an amazing uh, film. Um, great British horror, Paul. This is from Great British Horror, um, whose name I can't remember. I know this gentleman and I can't remember his name. <laughs> <laughs> I do as well. Steve. Steve. It's Steve. 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 Sorry, I stood up because he's pinned up on my notice board. <laughs> Hi, Steve. Sorry, Hi. Steve. Hi, Steve. Um, Paul, I haven't had a chance to start on Monsters yet, but looking forward to it. Nick, ha- hope all goes well with rats. Looking forward to that too. Okay, quick top three. The Fly, Cronenberg version. The Wolf from American Werewolf. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. American Werewolf. And the Xenomorph from Alien. Literature, Mr. Hyde, my all-time favorite. Yeah, yeah, no, not thought about um, him at all. Yeah, no, great one. Absolutely great choice. The Inhabitants of Midian. Yes. Um, 
and anything created by R. Chetwin Hayes, especially the sham, the Shadmock. Um, the Shadmock. R. Chetwin Hayes. Now, I know the name, but I don't know the Shadmock. Um, Great writer. I, I've not come across the shad, Shadmock. But, the Shadmock. Uh, Shadmock. But, Unless uh, that's Shamrock. Uh, no, no, the Shadmock. It's really the Shadmock. Okay. Yeah. Let us know a little bit more about, uh, about Steve. If we've got time, we shall uh, do it. Ferguson, great show. Thanks for answering my questions. Uh, looking forward to mindless and seeing more of your acting work. Nick and Paul, what Paul has coming our way. Many, 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 making many horror fans salivate. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Jaw has just got dying at the end here now. Make many horror fans salivate. It's a great tongue twist, twist of that one. Maybe they look at the moon too much, as Paul seems to be doing. All the best, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is brilliant. Thank you so much to everyone. Thank you, uh, Kelly. Uh, you can watch us on the, um, uh, the, the usual. We'll be on YouTube as ever. Um, Paul, thank you very much in indeed for joining me. Thank you for having me back. <laughs> <laughs> we look forward to seeing this. We look forward to seeing um, uh, Sherlock Holmes and the Servants of Hell, um, Blood Red, and uh, uh, those coming out later on in the year. Um, and what else are you working on at the moment that you can tell us about? Oh, I've just finished a short uh, film script, um, a couple of graphic novels I've been working on uh all kinds of stuff really some short stories now i've just sold another collection so i've got to do a couple more uh new short stories for that so um just brilliant busy all the time just busy <laughs> <laughs> that's good we like busy busy is good like busy <laughs> yeah yeah busy is very good we all like busy and you know selling stuff as well that's good we like that a lot yeah absolutely <laughs> paul thank you very much indeed thank you to everyone Guys, this has been Chattering with Nicholas Vince, and I've been chattering with Paul Kane about his upcoming books and projects and our top favourite monsters. Uh, Paul's waving goodbye. <laughs> I hope you see you next week, folks, when we're going to be discussing The Crazies, original versus remake. Take care, and we'll speak to you soon.